Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. One pleasant summer evening, when I was about 13 years old, give or take, I was out in the deep country at a gathering of some friends. It was dusk. The sky was lit up with oranges and yellows and blues, and me and a dozen friends were playing hide-and-go-seek tag. This was on many acres of land, so we had a lot of places to hide. If you ever want to play professional hide-and-go-seek tag, you got to do it in the country. It really ups the ante. And if you aren't familiar with this game, the way it works is that one person is designated as it, that is, the person who has to go looking for everybody else. But he or she doesn't only have the job of finding you, but once they do, they have to tag you with their hand, and then you become it. And now it becomes your job to go find everybody and tag them to make them it and free yourself from that responsibility. When the game started, I was not it. I was one of the people running off to find a good hiding place. And I had raced off to an area where there was a rolling hill and some trees. And from there I knew I would be able to stay hidden while at the same time keep a 360 degree view of all of my surroundings. This was also the same general area in the woods where years later... I would take a girlfriend on one rainy but full moon night and have my first real, full, uninterrupted access to breasts. And if you can imagine, with the slippery rain and the full moon for mood lighting, a heavenly experience. But back to the story. Years before, I'm out there in this same area of the country playing hide-and-go-seek tag and I found the spot where I'm going to hold my ground. I stayed there for a while, hearing the shouts and the sounds of the others, feeling very secure, when I decided to peek over the hill to see what the overall situation was looking like, and when I did, I was shocked to see that only yards away, the guy who was it was not far away at all, and he was moving in a beeline, directly toward my position. Since he hadn't seen me yet, I threw myself down into a crouched position to hide myself from him, and that's when my knee bumped the ground, and I felt a sharp pop. Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host. If you get a chance, run over to thelastsymptom.com to take advantage of the many free resources that I offer. While you are there, if you'd like to make a financial donation to support my overall body of work, you can do that securely right from the site. How's your week treating you? Mine is going fine and dandy, let me tell you, especially for now that the blistering heat wave has calmed. Truly, since summer began, these last several days have been the only really pleasant days so far. If the whole summer could be like this, oh boy, what a great arrangement that would be. I'm a very experienced, lifelong bass fisherman. I don't fish as often as I used to, but for all the years growing up and throughout my 20s, you would find me out at some remote body of water almost every summer evening. Nothing was more satisfying to my soul than the solitude of being out in some remote woods 
with a body of water and enjoying the last two hours of sunlight while fishing. The things I've seen while alone fishing in some remote spot, the experiences I've had, I'd never have time to tell you all of them, nor would you believe half of them. Things like having a litter of baby foxes roll out from the weeds playing, and then their mom coming out to join them. Being able to watch just feet away from them, and them playing without ever realizing that I'm standing just right there. Beautiful, fulfilling experiences like that. Also, the last few hours of a summer day spent somewhere in quiet solitude while the air is cooling down and the light is changing. There's just something unbelievably magical about all that that creates the perfect conditions for deep thought and reflection. At any rate, this summer I bought my daughter all of her own fishing gear, and I updated a bunch of my gear for the first time in years, and I've been eager to take her out and teach her how to fish, and she's excited about this too. But any time I've had time like this to spend with her, the temperatures have simply been too unbearably hot. Not even the fish want to eat when it gets that hot. So hopefully now that things have mellowed a little bit, I'll get a chance in the next several weeks to take little Eloise out for a fishing trip. Yes, I do clean my fish, and I do eat them. I fillet them as soon as I get them home, so that all I end up with is the meat, and then I store that meat in the refrigerator until a later time. Once, when I was a teenager, this came in real handy, because my parents were away for the week, when a massive snowstorm hit. Our house got buried under many feet of snow and attempting to drive down off the hill and all of the many miles into the nearest town for groceries was just out of the question. The electric was knocked out, so I had to move the contents of our freezer out into the snow. About five days later, <laughs> when, the, when the food was running out, I had all of these fish fillets from the previous summer, out in the snow that I was able to bring in and fry up in a pan. So I've never forgotten about that, and i that's what I do with the fish that I catch. I fillet them, toss them in the freezer, and I just keep them in there until a future day. One of these days, I'd like to tell you all about bass fishing and the different skills and knowledge that are required to do it well. But for now, I think we should get back to our main conversation of the day, which is self-harm. Maybe you're wondering how my introduction today could possibly have anything to do with this topic, but we'll get to that soon enough. Is self-harm an aspect of borderline personality disorder that every single person who has the disorder will deal with? Is it one of those symptoms of borderline personality disorder that every person experiences? Well, if you had asked me that question a few years ago, I would have firmly said no, because I, myself, certainly did not ever behave that way. In fact, I don't know how you feel about it, when you learn of people who behave this way, but I found it downright infuriating. I found the topic very offensive. For example, I know a woman who, at least in the past, would cut herself with knives. If you see her today, she has deep, pronounced scars all over her arms. This woman was my brother's ex-wife. And he becomes so enraged on one occasion after she had cut herself, after swearing that she would never do it again, that my brother grabbed a knife off the kitchen counter and said, every time you do it, I'm going to do it too. And he sliced his own arm, and then he told me, brother, that was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. That hurt so much more than I thought it would at the time while I was angry. But you understand, he was incredibly frustrated at her. And I understand that frustration, because until a few years ago, 
It was the same attitude I had about it. There's just nothing attractive or logical about a person who hurts himself or herself. And the rational mind says, there's no reason for that person to behave this way. There's no rational, positive purpose that it can be serving the person who engages in this sort of behavior. If you're somebody like me, who had borderline personality disorder, but could not identify with the practice of cutting or any of these other obnoxious, disgusting, physically destructive things, you've probably felt pretty justifiably annoyed by those who do behave this way. Why don't they just not do it? You might have caught yourself wondering, and you know, you're not wrong for wondering that. Let's take a minute to consider where the compulsion of self-harm comes from, and maybe we can get to the bottom of it. This might be helpful for some people to immediately dissipate some of the power that is at the root of the compulsion. As with every symptom related to borderline personality disorder, everything originates with the two fundamental erroneous perspectives that folks with the disorder live with. My longtime listeners can repeat this by heart, but it's important to mention them frequently, while at the same time, never allowing ourselves to take them for granted, as if they were simply an abstract concept. They're not simply an abstract concept. They really do explain every symptom that everybody with the disorder experiences, even when the connection isn't immediately clear. So every time we examine a different aspect of the disorder and we're trying to explain it, what we're really only doing is trying to trace the symptom back to the cause of the disorder. These two foundation, erroneous perspectives that people with the disorder all live with And what's the purpose of this? Well, it explains exactly why that symptom is happening. And it also helps make real to the person that is trying to authentically recover from it that they really do live with these two beliefs, that they're not simply an abstract ethereal concept, that the person is truly being manipulated and This allows them to begin seeing the manipulation happening in real time. Seeing it happen in real time helps you be more self-aware and mindful. And this, in turn, helps you be more in control. What are these two erroneous perspectives that people with borderline personality disorder live with? It's this. My feelings are devoid of worth. They're humiliating and irrelevant. And if this is true about my feelings, then it's true about me, myself, as well. So there you go. Now you know what borderline personality disorder actually is. It is merely the result of living with these two core certainties in life. What is the opposite of the two distorted core beliefs of borderline personality disorder? What perspective do truly emotionally healthy people view the world with? It's this. My feelings are never good or bad, right or wrong, and I have inherent worth. Now think about this for a second. If a person views the world through the certainty that their feelings are never good or bad, they're never right or wrong, and that they as people have inherent worth, that is, worth that is an ingrained part of them, which they never have to do anything to earn, is this the person that you expect to purposely hurt themselves. 
No, of course not. And why not? Because the certainty at the very foundation of who they are as people cannot translate into that type of behavior. That type of behavior is utterly opposed to how they view the world. Not only would they not behave that way, but it would never even occur to them to behave that way. And also when others behave that way, it boggles their minds as to why. But how about the person with borderline personality disorder? What is the only types of behavior that their foundation certainties about life and self can translate into? Well, you see it every day. The very thoughts, feelings, and behaviors you see produced by the distorted core beliefs are the very symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Where the healthy foundation naturally translates into healthy behaviors, notice that emotionally healthy people aren't trying to behave healthfully. The way they behave is simply a natural extension of their accurate, healthy, foundation perspectives on things. By stark contrast, what is the only types of things that the borderline personality disorder foundation perspective can translate into? Self-loathing, self-hate, self-disgust. What is the natural reaction or feelings that we as human beings experience towards anything we are literally disgusted by or that we loathe and hate? I'm not talking about dislike. I'm talking about literal hate, literal loathing. For example, what are your natural feelings towards child molesters, utter repugnance, right? More than repugnance. The world, society, would be better off without them completely. Nothing they offer our world can even remotely compensate for the overwhelming stain and damage that they bring to it. So if every one of them dropped dead today, would I care? No, I wouldn't care. I would celebrate an instantly safer, better world for my daughter and for all the children of the world. Now, why did I bring up such an uneasy, disgusting example? Because what you should have just felt when you imagined these deviants this deep, natural repulsion. It's similar to what those with borderline personality disorder feel toward themselves, but entirely without cause. In other words, the repulsion they feel toward themselves is not dependent on anything they've done or have failed to do. From their point of view, repulsive is sort of their natural state. I say sort of, because the actual feelings are not strictly repulsion. They also include a great deal of humiliation, embarrassment, and shame. It's kind of hard to describe the actual feelings going on inside a person with borderline personality disorder toward themselves with a single word. But all of these things, which is really just shame, you know, shame is humiliation, repulsion, embarrassment. But for now, let's focus on the repulsive aspect of the feeling. From their perspective, they don't behave repulsively necessarily, nor do they do repulsive things. They simply are repulsive as their natural state from their perspective. This repulsiveness or self-loathing is the only thing the foundation certainties they live with can translate into do you see why that is? A person who sees herself or himself as inherently, naturally, offensive to life, 
does not think, wow, I just love myself. See, one cannot give birth to the other. Only people who live with the accurate, healthy foundation perspective that, you know, my feelings are perfectly natural. There's nothing good or bad about anything I ever feel. And I have inherent worth, which means I never have to earn it. Only these people, as a natural result of the beliefs they operate on, are able to think, wow, I love myself. So now, do you see the clear reasons why anybody self-harms? It's as absolutely clear as day, isn't it? And for the record, self-harm is not strictly a borderline personality disorder thing. I sort of get frustrated with people who think that it is. It's a serious dumbing down or oversimplification of everything. You know, it's like, oh, that person cuts herself? Well, she must have borderline personality disorder. Or it works the other way, too. Oh, you've got borderline personality disorder? You, I don't see any cut marks on your arms. How come? And that's not necessarily true. It, bo borderline personality disorder and cutting are not inseparable things. But from now on, you should never again have to meet a person who self-harms and have to wonder why it is they do it. They do it because they loathe themselves, and they're treating themselves in the only way they feel they deserve. It may be difficult to understand that the same loathing you feel for a child molester and the sorts of violence you would gladly take against such people can actually be the same thing generating a desire for harm and violence against oneself, but it is. Now, here's an important question for you. Is this self-loathing and hate the only thing generating acts of self-harm? Well, maybe we should ask another question as well. What changed me a few years ago that caused me to readjust my view on the topic of self-harm, which in turn caused my feelings about it to evolve? Let's go back out to that evening in that area of the country when I was 13 years old and playing hide-and-go-seek tag with my friends. I've just peeked up over the hill, and there's my friend William coming straight for my location, and I panic, and I quickly drop to the ground. And when I do, my knee hits the ground, and I hear a popping sound. Oh, boy, it hurt. I don't know what I did, but whatever I did, I did it wrong. <laughs> and here I've just injured my knee. So I rolled around for a minute or two holding my knee, and I told my friend Will that I needed a timeout. And he came, he helped me to my feet, and I leant back, oh, I reckon about two football fields lengths distance, back to the gathering where most of our friends were. Everybody there was concerned about me, and I was now sort of the star attraction among all of these people. They all wanted to know what had happened, and it brought me much attention. And here is the part that I had forgotten about until just a few years ago. Not really forgotten, I guess, but I had certainly pushed the details far out of my mind. I, I had lied about it for so many years that the lie had started to become the truth in my memory. As I left this gathering with my family, my knee started to feel much better, and I realized that probably by the next day, my knee would be completely back to normal. And what would that mean? it would mean that the concern and attention of other people would go away. So that night, while I was alone in the bathtub, and I saw the swelling in my knee going down, I began to quietly, with my fists, hammer on my knee until I was able to bring the swelling 
back up. I kept doing this. Later, I was taken to the doctor and I was given a brace and some crutches, which again brought me renewed attention and concern from others. And for several weeks, I continued to hammer on my knee with my fists every time I noticed the swelling starting to go down. It felt so good to have others concerned for me, to have their attention, that I desperately did not want it to go away, which I knew it would if I no longer had this knee problem. Why would it go away? Because inherently, I'm worthless. The only time I get to feel real worth is when I get it from external sources, that is, other people. And how do I get it from other people? I have to fool them into thinking they have a reason to care. I have to earn it. And that's what I did. Until my knee developed a serious infection in the bone. And I had to be taken to the hospital and go through a debridement surgery on my knee where they surgically remove, they, go, they cut you open, they go in, and they surgically remove pus and infection. This was followed by a week-long stay in the hospital, which was then followed by about three months of living in a huge, uncomfortable, double-leg cast, which was then followed by about two years before my knee's range of motion had returned to normal. To this day, I have a huge three-inch scar on the side of my right knee, as well as four small scars, which were the drainage ports for my knee while I was recovering. My knee throbs from discomfort when the weather outside changes. I suspect I've got arthritis in this knee. Even while wilderness backpacking, I have to be constantly conscious of my weak knee and never allow it to be turned in an improper way. At the gym, I can't do squats with free weights. I tried it once and my knee could not support the weight and tried to bend backwards on me. Have I ever self-harmed? Yes, I have. And in a much more dramatic, permanent way than most of the people I used to be so critical about. But like I say, I had pushed the details out of my mind and I had spent so many years repeating the lie that I had simply injured my knee in a hide-and-go-seek mishap that this explanation had started to become the only thing I remembered. My knee will never be the same, ever. And one of these days... It may again become a great problem for me. Fortunately for now, I can continue to run and hike on it with very few problems. So now, is self-harm something that every person with borderline personality disorder does? I'm going to say yes. Because when we think of self-harm, we're usually thinking of some very specific dramatic things, aren't we? And if we aren't personally doing those explicit, specific things, we tend to say, well, I don't do that specific thing, so it doesn't apply to me. But let me ask you, how regularly do you shower or brush your teeth or watch your diet or make it a point to exercise? Neglecting these things is a form of self-harm. Because self-neglect is self-harm. It's showing a lack of concern for oneself, which is a form of self-abuse. How often do you abuse alcohol or marijuana or cigarettes or cocaine or take your pick? How often do you have dangerous sex? How often do you drive while intoxicated? All of these things are forms of self-harm, aren't they? After I remembered the full details with my knee, 
other details began to come back to me. One night, in particular, after a furious fight with my dad, I threw some belongings in a trash bag and I ran out of the house. Because we lived many miles out in the country, out in the woods, and I was still in my early teens, I had no car. I knew I was going to have to walk all the way into the nearby town in the dark, and it was my plan to walk to my grandpa's house. He had a a camper trailer uh, parked out behind his house, and I was going to sneak in there and spend the night, which I did. So I took down walking down these dark country roads. After a mile or two, I collapsed in a clearing off to the side of the road, and I began to cry and wail in my hurt and anger and frustration. Then you know what I started to do? I started to punch myself in the face as hard as I could. I did not hold back at all. I struck myself in the face with my fists as hard as I could until I was lying there bleeding. Why would I do this to myself? Was it because I was angry at my dad? No. You don't punch yourself when you're angry at your dad. What I did, I did because I hated myself. I loathed myself. The only thing that could explain how my father could treat me this way, how I could have ever been put in this situation, how he could put me through such unbearable emotional and mental torture, was that there was something wrong with me. Isn't that sad? I didn't look at the situation and see the obvious, that my father was abusive because of himself. It had nothing to do with me. Rather, because of my demented idea of love and loyalty, it was easier for me to blame myself and take it out on myself, to hate myself more. That night was very hard for me, and it sticks out in my memory, primarily because that was the night I looked up at the stars and I told God that I hated him. And as soon as I said it, I regretted it. I quickly regretted it, and I know that God understood the full context of the circumstances and the emotional turmoil that little boy was experiencing. And not only did he see it in context and not hold it against me, but his heart was probably breaking for what I was dealing with. So this is the part I had usually remembered up until about three years ago. This moment I had with God. Three years ago, I started to accurately remember the times I had self-harmed. And now I remember beating myself up with my own fists. And I remember exactly who I was angry at. Not at my dad. I was angry at myself unfairly. And then, of course, I started remembering even further back when I was four years old. Four years old. And I got a magnifying glass. And I would sneak it outside and use it to burn myself with the sun as a way to punish myself, get this, as a way to punish myself for anything bad I might have done. Now what sort of opinion do you have of parents who put their children through so much emotional pain and turmoil that by four years old, they're burning themselves with magnifying glasses and then later punching themselves in the face and later irreversibly destroying their knees, all because their parents have led them to utterly loathe themselves. Would you say this is less serious than a father or a mother who simply abuses you physically? Absolutely not. There is nothing, nothing less serious about emotional abuse and neglect. If anything, 
emotional abuse and neglect is a much, much more serious crime. Don't you think it's about time society caught up with this perspective? The effects of emotional abuse run much deeper and continue destroying that child clear into adulthood and right into old age and to the grave if never corrected. So what is the solution? The solution is correcting the cause of the disorder. Those two distorted core beliefs at the very root of everything that borderline personality disorder is. If you don't have borderline personality disorder specifically, but you self-harm, what is the solution? The same solution. You are living with the same fundamental perspectives, and they are translating into the same behaviors. They must be clearly identified, fully understood, and rooted out. If this is your first time listening to my show or being exposed to my work, I encourage you to listen to as many episodes of this show as you can to understand the specifics of how to eliminate the unhealthy foundation perspectives that are fueling these sorts of behaviors in you. The cure is a complete accurate education or information followed by insight. What this means is that it is a process which will require a broad, comprehensive understanding by you of many different elements. No superficial, step-by-step guide is the answer. The answer is a complete, broad, comprehensive understanding, and that requires the intake of much accurate information, the rejection of bullshit information, and then the deep rumination over the good information. And the striving, then, for insight on the subject. (laughs) 